Hi, I'm Mark Michael from uh, the Illinois Bone and Joint Institute, and today we're going to talk about cervical disc replacement and the expanding indications for that surgery. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, Armin, would you like to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you so much. I'm Dr. Armin Kachatorian, and I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm the founder and director of the Disc Replacement Center in Salt Lake City, and that's uh, the primary passion and the focus of my practice. And Deeps? I'm Dr. Deepak Reddy. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon in private practice in South Bend, Indiana, working for South Bend Orthopedics. Uh, and I am seven years out of practice, no, or out of training now, so, uh, but uh, have been probably doing disc replacement for all seven of those years. Well, welcome, guys, and thanks for being part of this. Um, so as we know, there's a lot of clinical data showing that cervical disc replacement uh, is uh, a great surgery uh, with great outcomes comparable to and even possibly better than ACDF surgery, and it's become more accepted amongst most surgeons. One of the issues we're facing though, and part of it is uh, surgery experience and part of it is insur insurance approval, is that it's been very limited in its indications, uh, specifically now most, uh, most indications are limited to one or two level disease, um, very limited degenerative changes in those segments, uh, limited kyphotic um, uh, deformity in those segments. And so uh, surgeons such as you guys that do a lot of these procedures, um, you know, it's, have experience with expanding the indications. And I'd like to hear some of your, your thoughts on these things. Sure, I'll take a first stab at that. So uh, I've been doing disc arthroplasty now since 2006 as part of ID studies. And then uh, as more and more discs became available in the market, along the way you start incorporating them into your practice. And when I first started doing arthroplasties, I stuck with what I consider to be the ID-based indication. So I call that kind of the small circle in the middle of the big target, right? And the target being the patient population. I stayed in that circle for long enough to develop the skills as well as the comfort level to use this new technology. Along the way, patients come to you and start asking you, well, can you please do arthroplasty for me? And then you start encountering different pathologies that may be outside that circle. And what I did over a period of time is slowly start tackling problems, the ones that you just mentioned, right? More advanced degenerative changes or more facet-based disease or more kyphosis or more or multi-levels, right, above one and two levels. So each one of those or another, you know, kind of relative contraindication would be somewhat poor bone quality, right? So each one of those problems, I started tackling them individually and then over a period of time, you start combining them and suddenly you start seeing a patient that may have two or three or four of those issues that you have to deal with, but then be able to address them in such a fashion that ultimately you still get a great outcome and you still preserve motion for these patients. Oh, absolutely. And there's a fine line with uh, being willing to kind of push the indications and still uh, maintaining uh, a great outcome for your patients. Um, so how have you tackled kind of scenarios where you know that doing either like a skip level or a three level uh, or a patient that uh, may have a little bit more degeneration than is considered the classic arthroplasty patient. How do you approach those cases? So I think very similar to what Armin discussed is you, you slowly expand your indications, right? You don't go from the gold standard or the sweet spot to a four level disc arthroplasty case, or you don't go from to a, you know maybe a severe kyphotic case at the start. You start uh, with people who have a little more advanced degeneration, maybe more bone spurring, more facet disease than you would normally take, and you sort of expand the indications around simple problems and then expand to more complicated problems. I think the pathways forward have multiple avenues, right? I think there's myelopathy is one thing that some people Absolutely. feel somewhat hesitant uh, to use disc arthroplasty for when I talk to some of my colleagues, but we have at least some data to suggest that you know, in myelopathy cases that we can still preserve neurological function and improve neurological function as well as we can do with ACDFs. I think you know, that goes to three levels, right? I mean, three levels in myelopathy kind of go together in some ways. A lot of my myelopathy patients are getting longer constructs. Um, I think skip levels, hybrid constructs are important things to talk about expanding our indications because even though they may be um, smaller procedures than three level or four level ACDFs, I think they really do have a lot of merit in terms of how they progress and get back to work faster and have better outcomes uh, than some of my ACDFs. I'm basically building a longer construct by fusing those adjacent segments for those patients. And that's an excellent point. In this current community, in this climate, um, patient outcomes is the key. And, and to 
prove any innovation in, in medicine, you have to have a solid patient outcome. So uh, what is your experience um, uh, in following these patients in terms of patient reported outcomes? Yeah, so I don't do formal PROM scores, right? Uh, but uh, certainly we do very thorough radiographic follow-up. I continue to follow my patients with arthroplasty indefinitely. With fusion patients, you know, once they had established solid fusion, uh, my usual kind of uh, comment to them would be, well, you're a year out, everything is well. If you have a problem, come back. With arthroplasty, I continue to see my patients because I really want to see what's going on with the prosthetic mobile implant over a long period of time. So we have very good radiographic data. We have continue to take their VAS scores. We obviously continue to uh, document what's happening with them clinically. And again, obviously it becomes a little bit more anecdotal if you don't have formal outcome scoring system. But certainly my uh, feedback and you know, what I see with my patients has been tremendously positive. Uh, so it, this is technology that is, I'm going to stick with and I'm going to bet on this horse for the long run. Uh, and uh, I believe looking at so many different parameters, looking at the long-term IV data for one and two level, looking at some of the literature that's coming out now, talking about hybrids, multi-levels, looking at the cost effectiveness of this procedure compared to fusion, right? All those things are gonna start driving more and more surgeons towards doing arthroplasty. And I think patients are gonna, I mean, now already patients demand it, right? Oh yeah. So uh, it's, 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 it's striking to me I, how many of my patients that I come to see me are for second opinion because they've been told they need fusion. So these can be even simple. I'm not talking about complex three or four level, you know, uh, type of procedures, but one or two level younger patients who are still being offered fusion when uh, motion preservation is a much better option for them. So I think all these factors are going are gonna, to uh, gel together and move the market more and more towards uh, motion preserving uh, procedures. And in the, in the case of cervical spine, I believe, you know, uh, cervical arthroplasty is, is, is that procedure. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and finally, just to kind of piggyback on that, as patients are coming to you and specifically asking, are they a candidate for disc replacements? Can you do multiple levels? Can you do this over an old fusion? Um, how do you see the future of that going forward? I mean, I, I, I agree completely with what Armin said earlier, is that I think patients are going to drive a lot of it. I mean, a number of my early uh, cases where I expanded indications were more patient-driven, where my patients came in and said, I saw two or three spine surgeons already. Everybody told me I needed a another level fused, or I needed a two level ACDF. I came to you because I heard you're the, you're the guy who could do something different. And it kind of pushed me a little bit to, to rethink does, the problem and think, does, yeah. can I yeah. be that guy? And I think after seeing the outcomes and seeing I mean, some of my hybrid constructs are some of my happiest patients, you know, whether it's native or delayed, you know, some of those patients are my happiest patients. And I, I really do see, at least anecdotally, that on average, I can get better results doing that than I can with a, a two or a three level ACDF. I think the linchpin, though, driving forward may be less, you know, can we do this for three levels and four levels or myelopathy or complex problems and more trying to tackle the problem of, you know, today, we still have this huge imbalance of single level ACDFs versus single level disc replacements, right? It's still 80 to one, you know, 75 to one ratio of how people are treating single level disease. And I think until we can get people rethinking how they treat single level disease, it'll be difficult to get enough people who want to push the indications for a technology. Absolutely. And, and that's a discussion for another time is uh, the surgeon's reluctance to adopt the technology. But I want to thank both of you for joining in here. And I think that these are very thoughtful uh, comments about the expanding indications of disc replacement. And I'm actually very optimistic about the way you describe things going forward. So thank you. Thank you.